Okay, so uh, the next talk of our session is about time to secure signatures from uh, five new identification protocols by Echo Pin, Julian Ross, and Yasin Pan. And Julian will read the presentation. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. So consider the following setting. Uh, we have a verifier B that holds a public key and a prover P. And the prover P wants to convince the verifier that uh, it knows the corresponding secret key SK to the verifier's public key. And in order to do so, the two parties can run a three-move identification protocol, which I've sketched on this slide here. So in the first round of this protocol, um, the prover will send a commitment R to the verifier, and the verifier then responds with a challenge H. And finally, in the third round, the prover then computes from all of these values an answer S, sends this to the verifier, and the verifier then decides if it wants to accept this proof or if it wants to reject it. Um, so such three-move protocols are very well understood and have been considered many times in the literature, and uh, this is mainly to a very important transform called the fiat shamir transform. So the fiat shamir transform takes any identification scheme with three rounds and generically transforms it into a signature scheme which is secure in the random oracle model. And uh, I've listed some notable examples here. So probably the most well-known signature scheme that can be derived from this matter is the Schnorr signature scheme. But we also have the Katzlang signature scheme, Yukus Gatell, and Okamoto, and there are also other signature schemes. So before I uh, continue, I would like to give some motivation for what I'm going to present in the rest of my talk. And uh, the motivation for our work is mainly tight security. So what is tight security? Um, in order to explain this, maybe let's look at how we would prove security in general for a cryptographic scheme. So suppose we have some cryptographic scheme uh, on the left-hand side, and we have some algorithm A that breaks the security of this cryptographic scheme. Okay, let's say that this algorithm A has success probability epsilon and it runs in time t. The way that we prove security is that we come up with a reduction that takes this algorithm A and generically converts it into some algorithm B that solves some underlying hardness problem. For example, E log, LWE, or factory. And uh, the success probability of this algorithm B, I've denoted here as epsilon prime, and its running time is going to be t prime. Okay, so we will call a reduction tight if uh, roughly epsilon prime is equal to epsilon and t prime is equal to t. So what does this mean? This means that the uh, reduction preserves the efficiency of the algorithm A when converting it to the algorithm B. Um, so why do we care about non-tight reductions or tight reductions? Well, the reason is that as soon as we instantiate our uh, cryptographic scheme with concrete parameters, the non-tight reductions will always lead to larger security parameters, and this is undesirable. So whenever we can, we want to uh, prove a tight reduction. On the downside, however, um, of course it's much harder to prove a tight reduction uh, as compared to non-tight reductions. So this is the motivation, and um, well, many works have considered tightness over the past decade, and the problem now is that uh, all of the schemes that I showed you in the previous slide, which can be derived from uh, three move identification protocols, um, they lose a factor of Q when generically transformed, where Q is the number of uh, queries to the random oracle. Okay, so the random oracle is just going to be of an abstraction, uh, so any hash function will be modeled as a random oracle in this model, and um, this is just an idealized oracle which returns random strings when we ask it in the query. Uh, the reason for this loss is that uh, the fiat shamir transform uses, or the proof of this of security for the fiat shamir transform uses the so-called forking lemma, uh, which basically means that we have to rebind the, uh, the adversary. And the question is, can we prevent this loss somehow? Okay, and um, again, this uh, has been considered many times in the literature, and so far, many of the existing works uh, take the approach of uh, basing the signature schemes on stronger assumptions, uh, mainly decisional assumptions. Okay, so the cut spun scheme that I showed you before was uh, an example of a signature scheme which is tightly based on the DDH assumption, which is a decisional assumption. But there's also another example, um, which is the lossy ID scheme framework by Abdallah et al. from Eurocrypt 2012. 
And this lossy ID scheme framework actually inherently requires decisional assumptions. Okay, so and uh, our new idea now is to obtain tightly secure signature schemes from search assumptions, not from decisional assumptions, by looking at uh, five move schemes uh, rather than three move schemes. So that's going to be the approach. Okay, so now let's look at the uh, generic five move identification scheme. Okay, so it's basically the same thing as in the three move case, but um, here we uh, additionally have two rounds. Okay, so there's going to be an additional round of uh, commitments and an additional round of challenges which precede the three rounds that we originally had. Okay, and now I've just uh, denoted here this uh, first round commitment as R1, the first round challenge as H1, the second round commitment as R2, the second round challenge as H2. And now the answer, of course, can be computed from all of these values. And also the verification procedure can also depend on all of these values. Okay, so let's call a transcript a valid tuple that can occur as a, a part of this, or when, when we observe such a run of this live move identification scheme. Um, so the properties that you probably know from three move identification schemes now naturally translate to a five move case. Okay, first we have honest verifier zero knowledge. Um, this means that basically the prover reveals nothing about its witness, but it proves the statement. And the way that we simulate, uh, the way that we uh, formalize this is that we uh, have to show that the existence of an efficient simulator that can uh, come up with a valid transcript given just the public key PK. Secondly, we have uh, special soundness, here abbreviated as SS. And this means that uh, we can recover a secret key if we are given two valid transcripts of the following form. So the transcript should have the first round commitments in common, but from then they should diverge. And if we are given two such uh, valid transcripts of this form, then we can recover a secret key. Okay, so in this work, we will give a modular framework for Fiat Shamir based uh, identification schemes and uh, signature schemes. And um, we will present three instantiations of a transform from different hardness assumptions. And uh, most importantly, all of these instantiations have tied security reductions to search assumptions, which is a new thing. Okay, so here you see our basic PHMEA transform. It's very straightforward. Okay, if you sign a message M, the signer will pick um, R1, its first round commitment from the commitment set, and now it will using these, uh, this hash function h1, which is modeled as a random oracle, it will compute the value h1. Then it samples a, uh, r2, and then it computes in the same fashion h2, and finally, using its secret key sk, it will compute the answer s, and output sigma as r1, r2, and s. Of course, verification is straightforward, given these three values, verifier just verifies as it would do in, uh, in the run of this protocol. And, uh, well, just as a minor remark, uh, often it will be more efficient to compute the signature as only H2 and S, and this will always be the case when we can compute the first two values uh, from H2 and S. For example, you can do this with uh, the Schnorr signature scheme, but also with the Katzwang signature scheme, so a very well-known trick. Okay, so here you have a security diagram, which I'm going to walk you through, and it relates different security notions for identification schemes and the signature schemes that we can derive from them. So on the left-hand side, we have so-called PIM KOA, which stands for Parallel Impersonation Under Key-Only Attacks. And this is going to be a security notion for um, identification schemes. We formalize the security notion by a game, okay? So in the first round of this game, a challenger gives a public key to the adversary, and the adversary is now allowed to start too many runs of the five move identification protocol with the challenger. And it is considered successful if it can complete even a single one of these runs. That's the game. So now our framework gives a transformation which uh, doesn't incur any security loss from a signature, uh, from an identification scheme which satisfies the security notion, to a signature scheme derived by the Fiat Jamir transform, 
which satisfies the following security notion called unforgeability under key only attacks. So it's the notion that you have in the middle. Okay, so this notion now is a notion for security schemes, and this notion, the game for security, is formalized as follows. Again, the uh, adversary is given the public key, and now it may uh, ask as many random oracle queries as it likes to the random oracles. And finally, um, it is considered successful if it can produce a forgery on any message of its choice. Okay, and now for the last security notion, our, uh, our framework presents a transformation which uses the honest verifier zero knowledge property of the five round uh, identification scheme to come up with uh, the rightmost notion of unforgeability on the chosen message attacks, which is sort of the standard notion in the literature. Okay, and in this scheme, uh, this uh, security game, the, uh, the adversary additionally is given uh, a signature oracle. And the signature oracle can be used to get uh, arbitrary signatures of its choice. And here, the uh, adversary is going to be considered successful if it can produce a forgery on any of the messages that it has not buried, because otherwise it would be trivial to produce a message, uh, to produce a valid signature. Okay, so this is how these three security notions are related. And in fact, um, all of these modular steps also apply to the three move case, as was previously shown by uh, Kills, Mazni, and Pan at Crypto 2016. Okay? And so if you pay attention, then you will realize that I have yet to explain to you where actually for the three move case, we uh, incur this loss uh, in the security reductions because on this slide, everything is tight. So there's no security loss here. So where does it come from? To see this, we have to actually move one step further to the left and consider a further security notion, which is even weaker. So this security notion is going to be the non-parallel version of PIMQA attacks. Okay, so what does it mean, non-parallel? It means that now the adversary is given a public key and it is allowed to start only a single one of the protocol with the challenger. And it must complete this one. So it's a weaker security notion than the parallel version. And kids must be a punch show that for the three move case, there is an unavoidable loss between these two notions. Okay, and even that we did not uh, prove so in our work, we uh, strongly assume that this also holds for the five move case. Okay, now the problem is that uh, for many three move identification schemes, it's actually not possible to directly prove the uh, PIM KOA security directly in a tight fashion. So we have to take this detour, which incurs a loss of Q. This is the case for many three round identification schemes. In particular, for example, for Schnorr, when you can prove that it's not possible to, uh, to show a tight reduction to PIM KOA security. And this means that Schnorr, for example, cannot be proven tightly secure. So how does the five move structure help here? The five move structure helps because it allows us more flexibility to embed a challenge in the structure of the protocol. And uh, therefore, it's easier to prove uh, PIM KOA security tightly in, the, in a direct fashion. Okay, and uh, as an example, to show you some intuition why this is true, uh, on the next slide, I'm now going to present a simplified version of the Sheba Diamant scheme from Crypto 2005, as expressed as a um, five move event. Okay, so um, on, the next, on the next slide, I'm going to show you um, the a simplified version of the Chevalier Mount scheme, as I was saying, uh, which is a signature scheme from Crypto 2005, and um, I'm going to express the signature scheme as a five move identification scheme. So, the nice thing about the signature scheme is that it has a tight security reduction to the CDH assumption. Okay, so um, I sketched this five move identification scheme here. Let G be a cyclic group of prime order with generator G. Um, let's just briefly go through the protocol. In the first round, we pick some randomness R, then we compute U as G to the R, send U to the verifier. And now the interesting thing is here that the verifier now picks um, the challenge H as a group element from the group. Okay, it randomly samples the group element, and it sends this H back to the prover. Okay, now the prover will compute B as H to the R and C as H to the X, and send these two values back 
to the verifier. Verifier now responds with some charge C, and S is computed as Cx plus R, set back, and the verifier does these two checks, which I've sketched here. And uh, if you know Schnorr, then you probably have noticed that it's just uh, two parallel runs of Schnorr, which are sort of interleaved here. That's the idea of this protocol. Okay, so why does this give us more than the standard Schnorr signature scheme? How can we sort of uh, come up with a solution for the CDH problem given this protocol? So here's the proof idea. Say we're given some CDH challenge, G to the X, G to the Y, and we are asked to compute G to the X, Y. How do we do it? Well, we will take G to the X and we'll embed it in the public key of the verifier. And now notice that in uh, the second step, the verifier samples a random group element and it sends this group element back to the prover. Okay? And the idea is now to take g to the y and hide it inside of this random group element. Okay, and uh, you can do this by just taking g to the y and raising it to some random a. And now the third step, which I've marked in red, is a uh, crucial step of the protocol. Z is computed as h to the x. And h to the x, of course, um, is going to multiply x by, by y in the exponent, and uh, from this the verifier can recover the, the answer to the CDH uh, challenge. Okay, and so what I wanted to show here is sort of an intuition what uh, we get by having these two additional rounds, because in the three move case, there's no way for the uh, challenger or for the verifier to embed its CDH challenge in this random group element H. Okay, so for the remainder of my talk, I want to talk about efficiency a bit. Okay, so uh, basically what I'm going to present here is an online version of our uh, transformation. So to uh, motivate this, note that uh, in the signing step of the uh, fiat Jamir transform that I showed you, uh, we compute H1 as calling the random oracle on R1 and N. Okay, and this prevents pre-computation of this value because we can only compute it once we have seen it. So can we do better? The answer is yes. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to be able to compute this value before knowing n. And uh, the way we do it is uh, very straightforward. We just don't use it when uh, evaluating the hash function. And um, this gives us a second transformation, which we call OF of ID. And of course, this is not for free. So if we go back to the security diagram, we don't lose tightness. But now, in the step from UFKOA to UFCMA, um, whereas before we only required that the protocol be HVZK, it now also has to be special sound. Okay, so that's sort of the trade-off that we get here. Okay, and uh, using these two uh, transformations, we get three instantiations from different hardness assumptions. The first one is going to be uh, the CDH about the amount scheme that I showed you, but we can also get um, an instantiation from the short exponent version of CDH, and it's also going to have a tight security reduction. This is going to be a somewhat altered version of the GPS scheme from 2006, and uh, it's actually the first version of this protocol which uh, has a tight security reduction to a search problem. Okay, so previously this uh, was only proven uh, under a decisional assumption in the velocity framework scheme by Abdallah et al., which I talked about before. Uh, so the benefit of the scheme mainly is that it uh, allows for a very, very efficient signing step. Okay, and uh, using FS of ID, we also obtain a tightly secure scheme from the factoring assumption. Okay, so here's a summary of what I was talking about. So first of all, we gave a modular framework of security definitions for signatures that we can derive by the fiat jamir transform from uh, identification schemes which have five moves. And um, then I presented two versions of this uh, transform. So the basic transform uh, requires only HVZK, but does not allow for pre-computation. And the second version uh, does allow for pre-computation, but additionally requires special signs. <laughs> and um, the way that we avoid the security loss is by using the five move structure of, uh, that I showed you to uh, embed computational challenges in uh, the protocol in a, more, uh, in a more clever way. Okay, so what are all the questions in this area? Um, well, maybe if we have five rounds and it gives us something, 
Perhaps we can do more if we have even more rounds. I mean, that's very straightforward, but it would be interesting to look at this. Maybe for seven rounds we can, we can prove something more, who knows. And the second question is, of course, um, if we can build uh, five move identification schemes in this manner based on lattice assumptions. So these are two questions that I'm currently thinking about. And um, yeah, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Plenty of time for questions. Uh, can you tell me the reason why it's going to be difficult to create the lattices? Like, which was the bottleneck? Okay, so let's go back to this protocol here. Okay, so the reason that it's not straightforward is because um, this uh, structure that I show here, it actually it really depends on uh, CDH, right? So what you're doing here is uh, basically you're proving in the third step that, excuse me, you're, you're proving in the final step that uh, Z was computed in some certain way, right? So that this is very inherent. And it's not clear how you would translate this to, uh, to some instantiation from lattices because they don't give you the same structure. But that, of course, doesn't mean that it cannot be done, so. Okay, uh, so I don't know that much about zero knowledge and lattices, but yeah. I, I thought there's the Lubashevsky type, and yeah. that's like basically Schnorr type uh, zero knowledge proof. Exactly. And it doesn't apply to this case. I mean, as I said, uh, okay. it would be very interesting to see if it does, but uh, so far uh, I haven't figured it out. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's the Any other questions or comments? Please. Okay, so if there's no, so let's end speak again. Thank you.